pomeriggio a tutti, benvenuti al nostro quinto dialogo sull'innovazione. Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, marhaban bikum fi hiwaratina, hawla l'ittikar. Hada liqa'una al-khamis, al-mukhassas li majal al-ta'alim, li ta'allum al-elektroni, wa li l'amal, l'amal an bu'ad. Hal hada mustaqbal al-ta'alim? Good afternoon, welcome back to our dialogues on innovation organized with the Embassy of Italy to the UAE and the cooperation of the other Italian embassies in the region. Today, we will talk about e-learning and virtual working related to the world of education. As always in, this, in these meetings, our starting, starting point is the pandemic with all the sudden changes it has brought to everybody's life, including the increase and systematic use of information and multimedia technologies. In the education field, flexibility is by no means new, but until a few months ago, distance learning mostly affected employed people aiming for a higher degree. The main challenge for the educational system was to verify the skills acquired. Quite differently today, in pandemic times, e-learning is a global practice involving more than 1 billion students around the world. And exams are not the only issue. The challenges for both students and teachers have greatly increased and new tools and actions are needed. And a lot of imagination too, because distance learning and teaching, far from being simple online replication, are rather a reversal of the real experience. Needless, need, needless to say, presence and distance are conflicting concepts. Presence is physical proximity, immediacy, exchange, inclusion and belonging while distance is separation, exclusion, divergence. In all languages, from the Italian lontananza to the Arabic word, remoteness is a metonymy for obscurity, uncertainty, and difficulty in understanding. Talking about pandemic, technology, and the education system, let's focus on universities. Appointed to foster and spread the cultures of the peoples, universities are the engine of civilization and the inescapable basis for economic growth and social cohesion. To talk about it, we need data first. Let's listen to Francesco Ramella, professor of economic sociology in the University of Turin, and to Michele Rostan, also professor of economic sociology in the University of Pavia. They are authors of, the, of a research on e-learning in Italy during the pandemic. Francesco Ramella, Michele Rostan, can you illustrate the results of your research, please? Here we go. Okay, uh, good uh, evening or good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for inviting us to uh, this uh, seminar. Uh, Francesco uh, Romella and, and I uh, would like to share with you uh, some of the results of the survey that we have carried out um, on e-learning and virtual working of Italian academics uh, uh, during uh, the second term of uh, the last uh, academic year. Uh, <clears throat> you see here some of the key information about uh, this survey. Uh, I'd like to stress that what we will show you uh, are some results coming from the answers of a representative sample of more than 3,000 Italian academics. Um, the first aim of uh, the survey uh, was uh, uh, to know something about the experience our colleagues had during uh, the lockdown. And uh, for, so the, the, our question uh, would sign, sound like this, how did it go? And the answer uh, was, well, 
uh, fine, it was fine, it was uh, good enough. Uh, more precisely, uh, according to our respondents, um, we can say that most of them uh, were able to uh, shift uh, rather quickly uh, to uh, remote uh, distance teaching. And as you may know, uh, Italian government uh, decided to the general lockdown, uh, including universities, on March the 8th uh, this year, and uh, uh, say three out of four colleagues were able to start remote uh, teaching by March the 13th, so very quickly. Uh, the great majority of them were able to deliver their lesson as expected, to adapt their teaching to the remote mode, to maintain their program, uh, with no loss of students attending lectures. And finally, most of the exams, either course exams or final exams with thesis and so on, were carried out. Now, uh, as, as you can see uh, here, uh, uh, the most frequent type of instruction was a lesson in streaming through the communication application, uh, such as the one we are using uh, now that they had at their uh, disposal. But as you can see, uh, also other activities involving the use of e, the e-learning platforms of our universities were also <clears throat> carried out. So it's, this is a nice picture. It seems that there are no problems, but of course, uh, some problems were there. <clears throat> Respondents reported four types of problems. Uh, the least frequent problem uh, concern technology, especially the internet connection, uh, logistics, and especially space at home and reconciling work and family was a more frequently uh, reported issue, such as privacy, uh, that is worries about the improper use of didactical online resources by students, for instance, and also uh, some worries about, you know, a, a, a stricter control on teaching by uh, administration and the governance of universities. But the most frequent problem concerned didactics, that is especially being short in time to adapt to remote teaching, uh, scarce familiarity with technology. Uh, of course, for an engineer is one thing, uh, for others, from the humanities, for instance, is another thing to deal with technology. And of course, also more difficult relationships with students. Um, at the end of our interview, uh, we ask our respondents a, a final question and we can read it uh, together. Let's, let, let's do so. And the, and the question was, what would you like to keep from this distance teaching experience after the COVID-19 emergency is over. And as you can see uh, here, very few people said, well, I would like to go entirely with the remote mode. And the others, well, the others were split into two parts. First, there is say a bit less than half of them would say, oh, well, I would like to return to face-to-face -to -face teaching and that's it. I don't want to know anything about my uh, experience with COVID and, and uh, distant learning and, and, and so on. And on the other side, uh, a bit more than half of our colleagues would say, well, uh, I would like at least part of the teaching to, bury, to be carried out in a mixed form or a blended form, if, if you like, uh, in integrating face-to-face -face lessons with online activities. So to come to the end of my uh, short talk, looking to the future, which is our main focus uh, today, I would like to stress two conclusions. First, Italian academics display a strong polarization uh, as far as their future teaching is concerned. There are two big groups opposing each other. But second, a considerable proportion of them are open 
to the use of new technologies in teaching and to didactical innovation. And so these are the two lessons I guess we can take from this first part of our uh, report. And so I would like to leave the floor to Francesco to continue. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, very much uh, Michele. Good evening. And uh, first of all, let me thank you very much for your kind invitation. In the second part of this presentation, I want to address two specific points. The first one regards uh, the teaching. We asked a few questions, very specific questions, about uh, the modality, the activity performed inside the classroom before the pandemic crisis exploded and after and during the pandemic crisis. So we tried to compare the in-presence, in-person didactic with the distance uh, didactic performed by the Italian professor. Um, we would say, I would say that uh, we detected the three main style of uh, didactic before the pandemic crisis. At the two poles, we had two very extreme and different way of teaching inside the classroom. The first one was a transmissive dialogic style, a very traditional way of teaching that is mostly based on frontal lesson and on a transmissive logic of the knowledge of the knowledge. On the opposite, you had the professor, and uh, I would say a very a high percentage of professor, near 45%, who were more uh, interested in experimenting in, in teaching. For example, they tried to implement a more intera interactive and collaborative way of uh, teaching. So they asked more to the students, they asked a more active uh, role uh, to the student, and they tried not only to transmit uh, uh, knowledge, but also to stimulate the creativity, the capacity of problem solving of the students, as well as uh, their uh, soft skill. So what happened uh, during the pandemic crisis with the transition online of a didactic? The most uh, important aspect is that uh, a lot of professors that uh, in presence were experimenting innovative way of, uh, of didactic, uh, experimented a sort of regression to a, very, a more traditional way of teaching. So they passed uh, due to the transmissive dialogic style. So they were able only to implement uh, a frontal, frontal lesson using uh, digital uh, platforms. What about uh, the future? So um, we have asked also a lot of uh, questions about the future because uh, of course we were aware that this was an extraordinary and transitory situation. So we asked the professor how they imagine the future, if they can, uh, use blended form of teaching if and if they repute uh, think that this uh, form of the blended teaching can be helpful. A, a, a high percentage of professor, I would say, Italian professor, think that blended learning can improve the quality of the teaching and learning experience of the students. And distance teaching can help and support, promote lifelong learning and the mobility of, uh, of educational experience, as well as, I would say, the support to specific categories of students, the, more disadvantaged, the most disadvantaged uh, students. The second point I want to make is about the digital divide that was mentioned by Professor Rostan. As, we, as Michele said, 54% of Italian professors are willing at the end of a pandemic crisis to experiment with the blended learning. Other, instead, other 40%, 44% of Italian professors 
Okay, they hope to stop this experience uh, as soon as uh, possible. So they don't want, they want to forget about this experience. What, what kind of factor uh, make a difference? Why one professor belong to one group and another to the other group? The most important factor, cutting a long story short, we performed a statistical analysis. The crucial point is the kind of experience a professor made during the pandemic crisis. So quite obviously, if they had a positive experience, they are now more willing to experiment with blended learning. And they think, they think that also in the future, they would integrate in presence lesson with online activities. That said, the crucial point is to understand why this professor had a positive experience and others instead had a negative experience. And the three crucial points are the support they received. First of, first of all, the support they received from the university, their university, during the transition online. If they were helped to adapt, to adjust to the transition to the online didactic, they were uh, able to implement a better uh, solution to their students. The second point is about uh, personal proactivity, and the third is about their social capital. The extent and variety of network of the personal networks and professional network, because of course social networks helped them to face and to deal with the emergency and to make the most of the experience. So going to the conclusion, what we have learned from this research, the first thing is that university Italian university performed quite well during the crisis. They reacted promptly. I would say they reacted in a very effective way, demonstrating to a certain extent a strong and high degree of resilience. The second point is that Italian professor, as well as the university, rediscovered the importance of teaching, especially of in-presence teaching, teaching. Of course, no one can think to replace virtual class and the digital platform to the incredible experience that the professor and students have in presence. So no one can, no, nothing can replace the real classroom. And the second point is that no digital platform, no digital tool by themselves, by itself, can renew the didactic. So in order to make the most from the new digital technology, we need a specific plan of training for university professors, in general on didactic and in particular on the use of a digital platform. To conclude, I would say that this was a very intriguing and interesting experience from a didactic point of view, but it, it was an experience that must teach how important the didactic is and how important is the training of professor about didactic. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Francesco Ramella and Michele Rostan for informing us about your survey in such a detailed and yet simple way. From Italy to the United Arab Emirates, a country known to be at the forefront of technology. It's a great joy to have with us Hind Arostamani, Assistant Provost for Students Affairs inside the university, a regional leader in educational innovation with campuses in Abu Dhabi, and Dubai. Hinda Rostamani, you are also a social counselor and you have a highly experienced psychology background. What is the impact of the forced and continuous use of technology on students' well being? At the end of the health emergency, what will be left of this experience in your university community? And could e learning, in your opinion, ever replace face-to-face -face teaching. Please, Dr. Hinn. 
First of all, thank you for the invitation and thank you for our colleagues in Italy uh, and academia for your uh, useful information. I think uh, it, rests, it rests our minds to think that our colleagues have the same issues, you know, going through the same uh, uh, issues as we are going through it in UAE in terms of, uh, you know, uh, being forced between two brackets you know, to be in such a situation. So there are the positive parts and the negative parts of it. And, and we share the same experience. So I won't repeat what has been said. Uh, plus like, you know, maybe the focus is on the privacy coming from a culture where you have extended family and having everybody using the technology at the same time, thinking about the space and how the students sitting in front, you know, uh, studying and, and, and learning. In terms of the well-being, it was interesting how we were discussing before, you know, using the artificial intelligence to, to you know, um, outreach as much students as we can uh, to support them, uh, you know, especially in the field of mental health. And it was very interesting how the debate was, how effective it was, and, and how we can use it. We, we use it in a very, very rare cases when we had students at risk. But at the same time, when we were forced to use it, it was interesting how the whole thing shifted looking into, you know, code of ethics, policies, procedures, how we are going to handle students, especially students at risk, how are we going to reach them? So it was very interesting that the transition was very, very smooth. Uh, thank you to the IT, you know, that created all these platforms that were safe and secured and, and you know, abiding by the international rules and uh, the service continued for the students. Of course, if we look at it, there is a positive side and a negative side of, you know, uh, using the technology where you have the, you know, uh, the connectedness that how we are stay connected with knowledge and how we, you know, uh, are connected with people. But at the same time, there is the addiction part and the vulnerability part, you know, how vulnerable are we when we are uh, using, uh, you know, uh, uh, virtual reality uh, in the mental health field. Uh, one of the interesting things was how the challenge was big in Zayed University with the students uh, with special needs. And that was, uh, you know, very interesting how um, uh, some of them, especially the, the uh, you know, with the visual impairments, how they needed to be trained, how their families needed to be trained, and how we will not stop the education there and nobody will be left behind, which was very interesting how the efforts came to help the students, you know, and going to their houses, like, you know, and, and training the family, how will they use it, and then, uh, you know, successfully everything was set and the platforms were there for them to be able to, um, to continue their education. Uh, so th there are very, you know, uh, interesting parts of it. Then using the platforms of peer support, we had some, uh, you know, digital platforms where students were using it internationally uh, and, uh, you know, connecting with each other and how they support each other. And the concern was more to be supportive than being concerned about anxiety and stress and depression. So that was one of the interesting uh, parts of it. Uh, in terms of the future, yes, indeed, we are, uh, you know, the university started looking into how the future will be in terms of um, e-learning uh, discussion is going around because we have a sister univ federal university who is using it because they have different campuses across the Emirates. So, you know, so it is for us now to be thinking about this. Uh, it's very important to put it into consideration because especially we have students commuting, coming from other Emirates, the time that is spent on the road, coming to the university, uh, at the same time combining two campuses because we have two campuses, one in Abu Dhabi and one in Dubai. Uh, so there is a future into it, whether it's gonna be totally e-learning or blended, still we are in the process of uh, looking into it. And again, the students, of course, they are missing the face-to-face -face and, and the social part of it being in the university. So we are sharing the same experience like our colleagues in Italy. Thank you. Grazie, grazie mille.
uh, uh, to Hinda Rostamani for your insightful uh, contribution. And now I am honored to give the floor to Carlo Ratti, art architect, engineer, inventor, among, among the conceivers of the Italian Pavilion in Expo Dubai. He teaches at MIT in Boston, where he directs the sensible, sensible, I don't know how to pronounce it, City Lab, dedicated to a city which is sensible, but also able to sense, with an emphasis on the senses, on physicality and concreteness. Professor Ratti, I must say that the idea of this webinar was born from an interview you gave months ago, where you stated that distance, distance working reduces uh, what you call weak ties. And you endorsed a classical study by sociologist Mark Granovetter entitled The Strength of Weak Ties. So can you elaborate and comment this concept to our audience, please? Sure. Um, <clears throat> sure. First of all, you know, great to see uh, all of you and uh, uh, and an you know, interesting co conversation about the, the impact of the present changes on uh, working and uh, learning and teaching. Now, let, let me tell you very, very briefly about uh, what you just mentioned um, <clears throat> in about the concept of strong ties and weak ties. So we've been measuring actually the impact of the pandemic on the MIT campus. You know, the MIT campus uh, from one day to the next, like many campuses, many universities around the world, from one day to the next in March 2020 went uh, totally virtual. We closed the campus. Even today, a few people are allowed on campus, but you need a special permission. And so most of the people still work uh, like myself. I got an MIT picture behind me, but you know, it's, uh, I'm working from home. And, um, and so we've been monitoring what happened following the closure of the campus. And in particular, we've been monitoring the network of communications between all the people on campus. So you know, imagine that you have all the information about how people exchange emails and connect on campus, and you monitor that. And then you got a big discontinuity in March 2020, which is when physical space uh, uh, is removed. You know, the, one important variable in the equation is removed. And well, what we uh, discover, going back to, to what you were saying, and take this with a pinch of salt, is not published yet. We are still verifying the data. We are still collecting and analyzing more data. So it's still preliminary, but I want to share it with you, is that, um, well, um, if you take strong ties and weak ties, uh, uh, just a quick definition uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with Mark Granovetter's paper. So if you take our social networks, uh, strong ties is a uh, connection to a friend, and this friend has also at least another connection to another of our friends. So somehow I connect person A, I connect, I, I know person A, I'm connected with person A, I'm connected with person B, and A and B are also connected with each other. So that's what is called a strong tie, and usually forms a triangle, because uh, I know this person, this person, and they also know each other. So if you look at that as a network, it is like a triangle. But then you got weak ties. Weak ties um, are not weak because um, you don't talk too much with them, but weak ties are weak, uh, are called weak because, you know, there are people we know um, who are not friends of our friends, but usually they become bridges to a new community. Now, what Margaret Novetter discovered in the 1970s in a paper, which is a fundamental paper in modern sociology, is that uh, weak ties are very important because usually among strong ties, we keep on sharing the same information. We know what we know, and uh, we keep on re telling each other the same things. But new information many times comes from weak ties, from people who connect, us, connect people who connect us to a new community. And now, what the data on the MIT campus seems to suggest is that if you remove physical space, if you remove the campus, our social networks um, get weaker. And we lose a lot of weak ties, which are very important, as I was saying, for creativity, for getting new information, for knowing new communities, and so on. So, so somehow that's, um, that's our initial finding. There's another initial finding. It's about the fact that we, because everything is online, our communities tend to be more heterogeneous. So, you know, again, physical space forces us to connect with people who are more diverse from us. And that happens less 
if you're just uh, connecting online. So anyway, those two points, <clears throat> those two points uh, um, are uh, some of what we are seeing in the data. Again, take it with a pinch of salt. But I want to share with you just very, very briefly the consequence of this. The consequence of this means that if this is correct, um, probably we will still need to go back to offices. Offices, like any type of physical space, uh, is going to be very important. We cannot think about a university which is totally virtual. Virtual, uh, you know, that wouldn't work in the same way. We can certainly virtualize a lot of classes, but we cannot think about an education which is only only online. Um, and um, and somehow the broader consequences, if we spend less time in person in the office or on campus at the university, we kind of need to reprogram space to design it better to make sure that if the time is less the richness of interaction with other people on campus or in an office is, uh, is more. So that somehow we, <clears throat> we can uh, um, compensate for uh, less time spent with each other in physical space with more richness, with a more choreographed office or campus life. So that was a natural what I want to share with you. I, uh, there's a few articles uh, being published at the moment. There's some information on this on our website if you're interested in looking a bit more at the data. Again, take it with a pinch of salt, but uh, uh, at least a hypothesis. So consider it just a hypothesis. If this is going to be confirmed, you know, the consequences could be quite significant in terms of uh, the dream of moving so many things online. Very much. Thank you very much, Carlo Ratti, uh, talking to us from Boston. And now I want to introduce Pasquale Borea, Dean of the College of Law uh, in the Royal University for Women in Bahrain. This university was uh, established in uh, 2005 to train young women to become the future leaders of tomorrow. Can you comment, um, Pasquale? Borea, on the current situation from your own point of view and experience, please. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, buon pomeriggio, good afternoon. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm delighted to be here with you today, thanks to the IIC Abu Dhabi, thanks to Professor Zilio Grandi, and also thanks to the Italian Embassy in the Kingdom of Bahrain that has worked with uh, to, towards this event. Um, well, it's very interesting what, what has been said so far from three different perspectives. Very interesting, the study of our colleagues from Italy, the point of view of, of one of the big universities in the Gulf, like Zayed University, and very interesting also the assessment that the colleague Carlo Radi has done from, from, from the MIT. Um, uh, I would like to go back to a definition that has been given a couple of weeks ago. I was um, invited to a webinar with the University of Columbia and Professor Victor Martin from the University of Columbia said, this is not only a pandemic, this is a pan-democracy because higher education throughout the world is in the exact same situation. And the response that higher education has given uh, to this crisis, um, I think is reflected across the globe in the data that, that the two colleagues, Michael Rostan and Francesco Ramella, have shown us, with very few differences. I mean, I would be delighted to, to if they allow, to do the same study here in the Gulf to see the reaction that faculties will have to these questions uh, but I presume it will be more or less the same because, first of all, I mean, um, I'm a lawyer by formation and temper, so I, I used to go back to the problem and then discuss the present and then see the future. Now, the problem has been an unprecedented event that has happened, and we've been very lucky to operate in higher education at this time because when previous pandemics uh, have happened. Uh, I think about the black plug in 16th century or the Spanish flu and so on. University, universities across the world, the old world or the new world or the world uh, or the entire world had to close. So knowledge was impossible 
to be delivered to young generations. So we are very lucky uh, to be <laughs> part of this generation. Uh, and, and you know, sometimes people think about university professors or universities to be the luckiest category in dealing with this situation because I was, I was, I was speaking with, a, um, uh, with an old friend um, medical doctor, he said, look, you're so lucky because, you know, you're just sitting at home and teaching from a screen. That's not the reality, by the way, um, because there have been, of course, some advantages uh, for higher education institutions and also for students, but there have been some disadvantages as well for both of them. So disadvantages, of course, uh, include uh, loss of revenues, I mean, I'm, I'm talking from a perspective of a private uh, higher education institution uh, with a very advanced level of technological equipment. Um, uh, but of course, uh, we, we had a campus residence for foreign students. So this was all uh, a, a cost. Um, challenges. Now, I, I was very thrilled by the perspective that the two Italian colleagues have given about privacy. Um, with teaching material and all this stuff. Now, a big, big issue from a legal perspective is the copyright issues that are at stake in the digital learning, in the e-learning. What happens to the copyright of uh, the lectures that professors give online? I mean, we, we, have, we, we had to equip ourselves with stringent policies adhering to the national laws and so on. But this is, a, this is one of the challenges that the future uh, will, will uh, of course, uh, request universities to cope with. Um, for students, of course, it has been said, isolation, uh, lack of um, social uh, connections, um, uh, student life. But I think the most, um, let's say, challenging part is uh, how to deal with skills um, in this situation, because knowledge is guaranteed, okay? We, we, we deliver our classes online, uh, blended learning, by the way, for us, blended learning is not something new. We were using blended learning uh, from before. Uh, we, we have been trained for uh, quite few semesters before the pandemic was even um, predictable. Uh, so blended learning as a, as a um, lifestyle, uh, I think is one of the lessons that we have to get from this pandemic. Um, not 100% digital learning, because as I mentioned, e-learning can ensure that knowledge is given to the students. Uh, but of course, we have to be creative, especially in some disciplines, to provide students with skills. I mean, I, we in, in the law college, we used to train students, getting them in the moot courtroom, simulate a trial, uh, be in front of a judge, be working with external lawyers, and so on and so forth. And now we, that, to a limited extent, we can do this online, but the students don't feel um, the, the courtroom atmosphere. And this will be, uh, a lack for them. So we have to be creative and inventive. Also, I come from Italy and, and of course, though I left Italy a <laughs> long time ago, uh, immediately after my PhD, but of course I am a resource that has been formed in Italy. And, and what I miss more is, this, is, the, is, the, um, is mailing the books in a library. So you can have all the digital libraries that you have, but, but, but students, may not be used to have this fascination by books. Uh, and I faced this problem with my first year students, which were really taken care of. But I mean, these are challenges that need to be addressed. Advantages, well, advantages is clearly a flexibility of the academic staff, of course, except those like me that have wife and two children. So uh, we're, we're lucky enough that my children did not interrupt this meeting today. Uh, but you know this. This also happens, and and this also serves to, to uh, you know let the students understand that the academics and the professors are, are humans as well. So it's a good point. I put it in my pros list. 
um, flexibility for the students also. I mean, we, we are a university which trains women, uh, young women, uh, of course, uh, 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 Dr. Hint should know, being familiar with the region, but I tell it for the Italian colleagues and all, it's not based on a segregatory uh, approach. Uh, uh, universities are mixed here in Bahrain. Our university is aiming at promoting women leadership in the society. And I have a lot of students who are mother students, who have children. Uh, I have a lot of students who are working students. So the shift into uh, digital learning or 100% online learning gave an enormous benefit to this type of, of students. Of course, on the other hand, we have students with special needs which uh, go into the challenge. Uh, so challenges and opportunities, I would say. Uh, but to me, uh, the most important um, challenging for the future that I see a future uh, which is based on blended education, blended learning. So um, uh, 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 online learning as part of a variety of teaching and learning tools. Uh, but the challenges I think higher education institutions should look into are primarily the following, how to stimulate um, students' responsibility and ethics. Um, especially when it comes to examinations that are held online uh, and so on. How to bridge the gap between knowledge and skills, uh, because uh, skills are very hard to be transmitted online. Um, and, and overall, uh, I, I've always been a skeptical in the role of artificial intelligence or technology or the overrule of artificial intelligence and technology. But this is, of course, because of my formation. Now, if you talk with a colleague of IT, he will tell me, will tell you that I, I'm, I'm, I'm like an ape in the jungle that does not know how to deal with this kind of stuff. But um, technology, online teaching, and artificial intelligence uh, miss a soul that uh, the professor and the, uh, and the faculty uh, in general are able to transmit to the students. So um, these kind of values need to be guaranteed to the students as well. And so I really hope that uh, this uh, pan-democracy, which puts all the universities across the globe in the same situation, will also ensure that the future uh, responses that we give to this challenge and the other challenges that are ahead of us will, will take care into and uh, will take a close look into these issues. Thank you very much. Grazie, shukran Jazi. To Krantjazilen, to Professor Bonne, and thank you especially for mentioning the books, the smell of books and so on, because uh, we will have on November 10th, in two weeks, uh, another webinar called The Culture of Books. And our guests will be Ernesto Franco, Director General of Einaudi Publishing House in Turin, then Sheikh Al Mehairi, Director of the Libraries Department, DCT Abu Dhabi, Valentina Sagaria Rossi, Head of the Oriental Collections, Academia Nazionale dei Lincei in Rome, then Ahmed bin Rakad Al Amiri, Manager of the Chairman Office, Sharjah Book Authority, and Luca De Michelis, CEO, Marsilio Publishing House in Venice. So thanks. A special thank you to our guest speakers. So thank you very much to our public and uh, arrivederci.